It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure uh, to talk to you all today about uh, two subjects that I hope um, all of you in this room have some interest in, legal scholarship on the one hand and academic freedom on the other. What the relationship between these two items uh, is is a, is a complicated story, and I thought we might begin that story by looking at a little bit of history. It might surprise you all to know that academic freedom did not always exist in the United States. It, United States. it emerged at the beginning of the 20th century, and its birth was a result of a fundamental change in the mission of higher education in the United States. During the first half of the 19th century, the objective of most American colleges and universities was to instruct young men in received truths, both moral and spiritual. And this wasn't just an American phenomenon. If you look at England in 1852, John Henry Newman is saying the purpose of the university, in his famous book, The Idea of the University, the purpose of the university is to disseminate knowledge. It's not to create new knowledge, because if our purpose was to create new knowledge, why would we need students? That's what Newman is writing in 1852. That's the way Americans thought about it until American scholars began to travel to Germany after uh, the Civil War. And when they went to Germany, they became infected with the ideal of Wissenschaft, which refers to the systematization and the expansion of knowledge. And they brought this ideal back to the United States, and as a result, American universities began to change their aspirations. It was a moment of really tremendous historical significance when Daniel Coit Gilman, who was president of John Hopkins, could address in 1885 the officers, the faculties, the students, the staff of Hopkins to assert with confidence and at great length, he said, the functions of the university may be stated as the acquisition, conservation, refinement, and distribution of knowledge. It is the business of a university to advance knowledge. That's what he said. And as a result of the sea change signaled by a speech like that by Gilman, virtually, I'm guessing, virtually all of you in this room would view as um, unexceptionable, perhaps even banal, the observation after World War II by Karl Jaspers, the German philosopher, that, quote, the university is the corporate realization of man's basic determination to know. Its most immediate aim is to discover what there is to be known and what becomes of us through knowledge. If you go to the website of any university here and look at its mission statement, you are most likely to find some sentence, like just a quote from Harvard, creating new knowledge. That's what we do at universities. The invention of the concept of academic freedom in the United States is a direct result of this change in the mission of higher education in American universities. At its root, academic freedom is about how universities can be able to fulfill their new function of producing new knowledge. At the beginning of the 20th century, American universities were institutions that were owned. They could be owned by a church if they were parochial. They could be owned by the state if they were public. They could be owned by a private proprietor. But no matter who owned the university, whoever paid the university budget believed that it was their responsibility to control what was taught at the university and what was published by employees of the university, including their faculty who were considered as employees. So consider, for example, the very famous case of Edward Ross. He's an economist, a professor and economist at Stanford University. In 1900, he publishes articles saying the United States should go on a silver standard, not a gold standard. And he publishes an article saying we should support American workers by cutting off the supply of cheap immigrant Asian labor. Now, at that time, in 1900, Stanford University was owned by Mrs. Leland Stanford, the widow of Leland Stanford, who Albie Small called the Dowager Empress of Palo Alto. And <laughs> Mrs. Leland Stanford, being a good Republican, thought it was heretical so that anyone should think about the US being on a silver standard. And of course, her fortune had been built up in railroads on the basis of immigrant labor. And so she wrote the president of Stanford, David Starr Jordan, in 1900, and she said, no one who has such views should be an employee of Stanford, fire him which David Starr Jordan promptly did. And the shock ripples were palpable throughout the American professoriate because every professor felt that if what they published uh, angered 
or irritated the owner of their university, and every university had an owner, they were liable to be fired because there was no such thing as academic freedom. Faculty were employees at will who were subject to the approval of their employers. So eventually, the American professoriate got it together to think about how to defend academic freedom. They formed in 1915 a new organization, the American Association of University Professors, the AAUP. And this, the purpose of this association was to protect academic freedom throughout the United States. But of course, the AAUP first had to say, what is academic freedom? What exactly are we defending? And so it, it immediately published in 1915 what remains to my mind the single greatest exposition of academic freedom in the United States. It was the 1915 Declaration of Principles on Academic Freedom and Academic Tenure. In fact, this year we celebrate the centenary of that great document, which fundamentally altered the status of faculty throughout the United States. The ideas of academic freedom, which were advanced in the 1915 Declaration, would later be put into the canonical 1940 Statement of Principles on Academic Freedom and Tenure, which Bill Van Alstyne calls the general norm of academic practice in the United States. The 1940 statement has been endorsed by over 180 educational organizations, including our own AALS. So the 1915 declaration defined academic freedom as consisting of three components. It said, I'm quoting, academic freedom comprises three elements, freedom of inquiry and research, freedom of teaching within the university and college, and freedom of extramural utterance and action. 25 years later, the same three components were put into the 1940 statement, and now I would say in the 21st century, most of us in this room would probably recognize a fourth component of academic freedom, freedom of intramural utterance, the ability to critique matters of university governance. This afternoon at lunch today, because time is very limited, I'm only gonna talk about one of these four components. I'm only going to talk about academic freedom of research and publication, which I'm going to call academic freedom of research. So if you were to ask the average American professor what academic freedom of research might mean, my guess is, my guess is that they would analogize it to a First Amendment right to publish whatever they please without fear of sanction or penalty. I'm guessing that would be the answer. And this would be a fundamental misconception of the nature of academic freedom of research, a fundamental misconception of what academic freedom of research is about. So to put the point as coarsely as I can, imagine a young writer who decides to uh, publish an article, an expose article in the New York Times saying that the moon is made of green cheese. He publishes this article, of course it's all wrong. Um, the First Amendment says he has a right to his opinion, he has a right to be wrong, the state can't sanction him for publishing this nonsense. Now, imagine a young untenured professor of astronomy who decides to stake his tenure case on a new monograph showing that the moon is made of green cheese. That young professor is not gonna get tenure. He will suffer repercussions based upon his views. Right? Or consider this, a standard uh, principle of the First Amendment is we can't compel you to talk. But of course, in the academic world, we compel you to talk all the time. Remember, publish or perish. Remember that old phrase? Um, or in First Amendment land, we don't engage in content or viewpoint discrimination. You can't judge something based upon its content or viewpoint. But we do that all the time in universities. Universities are machines for content and viewpoint discrimination. We evaluate the merits and the quality of academic work whenever we decide whether to hire someone, promote someone, tenure someone, to give a grant, and so forth and so on. We act in ways in the university which are entirely inconsistent with the First Amendment. So academic freedom of research is really nothing at all like a First Amendment right. So then how should we consider? What is the model by which we should understand academic freedom of research? The 1915 Declaration conceives academic freedom of research as the freedom to pursue what it calls the scholar's profession according to the standards of that profession. Academic freedom, the Declaration says, upholds, and I'm quoting it now, not the absolute freedom of utterance of the individual scholar, but the absolute freedom of thought, of inquiry, of discussion, and teaching of the academic profession. 
So we, particularly we in this room, are so used to thinking of the idea of individual rights that this may seem an odd, almost unintelligible conception. How could, what would it mean to guarantee a freedom that does not accrue to professors as individuals, but instead to the profession itself? How can we make sense of such a strange idea? So reduced to its essence, the argument of the 1915 Declaration went um, something like this. It said, you cannot consider the university to be an ordinary private business venture. It's not like GM. The university is an institution that has public responsibilities. It has a responsibility to the public. What is that responsibility? The responsibility is to preserve, enhance, and distribute knowledge. And when the Declaration spoke about knowledge, it didn't have in mind, say, the charismatic knowledge that art produces or, produces or literature. It didn't have in mind the Cartesian knowledge that we have by the immediate apperception of our senses so I can open my eyes and know that I'm in a room uh, filled with people. It had in mind a particular form of knowledge. It had in mind the kind of expert knowledge that is produced by close-knit and integrated communities of inquiry. Now, communities of inquiry are otherwise known as disciplines. And disciplines are united by common practices, beliefs, and methods of knowing. And disciplines produce the kind of knowledge that it is necessary for the modern state to have. We need to know whether the climate is getting warmer. And you can't know that by walking outside. You know that by using the epistemological resources that the communities of inquiry that make up whether science and geology and physics help us to understand. We need expertise in order to govern ourselves, and expertise is always a matter of a community of people who make that expertise together. Disciplines of this nature are always, always hierarchical. They're always hierarchical in nature, and that is because one cannot speak with authority within a discipline until one is first trained in the relevant beliefs and practices and methods of knowing. That is why most disciplines subject new devotees to long and arduous apprenticeships in the course of graduate education. Disciplines are premised on the idea that there are better and worse ways of knowing something. And disciplines are also always committed to the idea of progress. And for this reason, disciplines encourage criticism and dissent. Academic freedom most of research, most precisely protects these aspects of disciplinarity. As Arthur Lovejoy, who was one of the authors of the 1915 Declaration, a famous American philosopher, would later put it, he said this, I'm quoting him now, the function of seeking new truths will sometimes mean the undermining of widely or generally accepted beliefs. It is rendered impossible if the work of the investigator is shackled by the requirement that his conclusion shall never seriously deviate either from generally accepted beliefs or from those accepted by the person's private or official through whom society provides the means for the maintenance of universities. Academic freedom is then a prerequisite condition to the proper prosecution in an organized and adequately endowed manner of scientific inquiry. Unlike the First Amendment, however, academic freedom of research also limits dissent. And it limits dissent because it requires that dissent be cognizable as an exercise of disciplinary competence. So you can't just dream, you have to set forth a critique that is intelligible to those who are already socialized into the discipline. Disciplines that do not encourage dissent or atrophy and, de and die. Uh, but on the, on the other hand, disciplines that do not bound internal criticism risk disintegration and incoherence. Living disciplines are therefore condemned to inhabit, to inhabit an unstable territory between, on the one hand, received hierarchical practices, and on the other, constant unmitigated dissent. Continuity is maintained because dissenters must first be sufficiently socialized into existing disciplinary practices that their criticisms can be formulated in a manner that is intelligible to members, to senior members of a discipline. The 1915 Declaration of Academic Freedom justifies academic freedom of research on the ground 
that it is necessary for universities to fulfill their public obligation to produce and to distribute knowledge. If faculty were merely employees of those who happen to own a university, like Mrs. Leland Stanford, and if faculty were controllable at the will of their employers, disciplines would be subordinated to the uneducated opinion of laypersons. And yet, the free development of disciplines is a precondition for the advancement of knowledge. John Dewey, who was the first president of the AAUP, saw this very clearly as early as 1902. At that time, he wrote that we should contrast false universities like Stanford in 1900. <laughs> false universities, he said, inculcate a fixed set of ideas and facts current among a given body of persons, whether that's the owner or the church or the state. We should contrast false universities with real universities that produce new knowledge. He says, false universities, this is a wonderful phrase, disciple instead of discipline. Real universities produce disciplines, that is to say, integrated communities of knowledge which can define and justify knowledge which is the function of universities. And for this reason, the Declaration makes its most crucial move. It says that faculty should not be considered the employees of a university. We are instead the appointees of the university. And in making this argument, the 1915 Declaration draws on the autonomy of legal knowledge. So they, an uh, they analogize faculty to Article Three judges. The president appoints the judges, but the judges are not the employees of the president. The judges don't do what the president says they should do. They are not his employees. The president appoints them to fulfill a certain function, which is to exercise legal expertise. And that's how we should understand faculty. We are appointed to pursue a certain function, which is the discipline, the advancement of the discipline. Right now, it may seem to overstate the case to analogize us to Article Three judges, but if you think about it, there's a lot of analogies which really work. So, for example, Article Three judges, the work of them are, the work of Article Three judges is subject to constant revision and review and content discrimination through processes we call appellate review. You know, appellate judges review the work of trial judges. They get it right, did they get it wrong? What's the better form of reasoning? And that's not inconsistent with being, having expert knowledge as a, as a trial judge. Moreover, the work of a trial judge, even of a trial judge, cannot be reversed by someone who's not an Article III appointee, right? Because then you don't have finality. And similarly, the 1915 Declaration says our work can't be reviewed by those who are not expert in our faculty disciplines. Our, so at root, academic freedom of research means the self-governance of the academic profession of the academic discipline. We are entitled to make judgments of competence, but those who are uneducated are not. And we have the obligation to make judgments of competence because it's only in that way that the discipline can advance. And that's what the Declaration means by affirming that academic freedom of research requires the absolute freedom of thought and of inquiry of the academic profession. That's what academic freedom of research is based on. Now, notice that whole argument is premised on the notion that faculty participate in the kind of discipline that can produce knowledge. And so the question that arises for us in this room is what are the implications of this justification for academic freedom of research for us, for those of us who have dedicated our lives to the vocation of legal scholarship? Do we participate? in a discipline that produces knowledge. There's been a lot of hand-wringing about that in the history of our profession. It goes all the way back to Langdell and to the founding of the AALS in 1900. And the negative position was perhaps most pungently, pungently taken by Thorsten Veblen in 1918 in his book, The Higher Learning in America. Veblen distinguished between, I'm quoting him now, the disinterested intellectual enterprise, which is the university's peculiar domain, and professional schools, which merely train men for work that is of some substantial use in the community. And on the basis of this distinction, Veb Veblen very famously asserted, I'm quoting him now, the law school belongs in the modern university no more than a school of fencing or dancing. <laughs> and, Veblen, and Veblen went on to say, Quoting him now, this is particularly true, he says, of the American law schools, which use the case method 
and devote themselves with great singleness to the training of practitioners as distinct from jurists and whose faculty stand in a relation to their students analogous to that in which the coaches stand to athletes. That's Veblen, 1918. Now, athletic coaches, of course, are not entitled to academic freedom of research because they don't produce knowledge. They're not part of a discipline. So are we. Veblen correctly perceived that since the beginning, American law schools have devoted themselves to training lawyers. And it is on the basis of this function that we are, in fact, accredited by a professional organization, an organization of professional lawyers like the ABA. And the question I just want to spend my last few moments discussing is whether it follows from this function that law faculty, when they do engage in research, do not qualify for the privilege of academic freedom of research. Are we like coaches or are we not? That's the question I want to discuss. I am going to argue that Veblen was wrong to analogize us to football coaches, although I would enjoy the salary of a football coach. <laughs> 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 so, faculty in <coughs> contemporary American law schools study law in two distinct but interconnected dimensions. First, legal scholars study the law from an external perspective. They use the accepted methods of social science to study how legal institutions actually work, how legal systems actually function. These institutions and systems range broadly from police to legislatures to the provision of legal services from courts to agencies to groups of citizens who mobilize to change legislation. Legal, legal, legal scholars study the operation, effects, and social meaning of these institutions and systems. They study how these institutions and systems may be rendered more effective, more legitimate, or more efficient. And when professors of law study legal institutions and systems from this external perspective, they produce the kind of knowledge that is usually associated with disciplinary expertise. But second, legal scholars also study law from an internal perspective. This is the perspective adopted by those who actually participate in the making of law itself. It is in these perceptions that the rule of law abides. And the rule of law exists entirely in these internal beliefs and practices of participants in the making of law. An important dimension of these beliefs and practices is the aspiration to make law more coherent and orderly, to increase what Ronald Dworkin calls its integrity, or Jeremy Waldron calls its systematicity. As Waldron notes, law does not present itself simply as an unrelated and unreconciled heap of commands. It aspires instead, to quote Waldron, to fit together into a system, each new rule and each newly issued norm taking its place in an organized body of law that is fathomable by human intelligence. The need for law to reaffirm its integrity explains why in the common law systems, judges always seek to integrate their rulings into a larger coherent whole. The aspiration to integrity underscores the law's ability to, to quote Waldron again, present itself to its subjects as a unified enterprise of governance that one can make sense of. The law's integrity is a matter of its meaning. It must be hermeneutically constructed by those well socialized into the practices and beliefs of the law. Establishing the law's integrity is an inherently normative task because integrity is itself an aspirational virtue. The law's integrity will always depend upon the kinds of ends we believe that the law ought to serve. And these ends can range from justice to fairness to efficiency to deterrence to moral transformation. But as we understand the ends of law, so we will understand the possible forms of the law's integrity. When legal scholars study law from an internal perspective, they seek to make better sense of the law as a whole. And they do this even if they're studying a tiny little branch of the law, like say contracts. When they engage in the internal study of law, the relationship of legal scholars to positive law is analogous to the relationship of moral philosophers to the actual moral instincts that we inhabit. 
both the legal scholar and the moral philosopher seek to clarify and to integrate the forms of life into which we are thrown. When legal scholars engage in the internal study of law, they produce knowledge of what the law might look like were it to become clarified and coherent. Now, the internal and the external perspectives on law are complementary. It is a premise of modern legal scholarship that we can improve the law from an internal perspective if we understand how legal institutions actually function from an external perspective. We know that there is something seriously amiss if the internal understandings of legal participants are out of line with the law's actual effects and operation. And it is also a premise of modern legal scholarship that law cannot be adequately studied from an external perspective alone without understanding its internal aspirations and principles. Otherwise, the scholar is put into the position of the anthropologist who seeks to study an alien culture merely on the basis of its external artifacts and behavior without any comprehension of the meaning of these artifacts and behavior to those within the culture. So there is also no doubt that the training of lawyers requires their socialization into the internal practices and beliefs of the law. And that's usually, I think, what we mean when we say we teach our students to think like lawyers. We mean we've socialized them to the practices and beliefs of those fluent in the language of the law. And the socialization of our students into the language of the law can be done by anybody who is fluent in the language of the law. But law schools produce more than mere fluency. We also hope to transmit the knowledge we produce by both the internal and external study of law. And we regard this knowledge as essential for the training of lawyers. And it is a premise of modern legal education that lawyers will better practice their craft and be of greater use to society if they understand how legal institutions and systems actually work. And it is also a premise of modern legal education that lawyers will better practice their craft and help better achieve the rule of law if they understand the internal aspirations of the law to integrity. In imparting these forms of knowledge, legal scholars, let me say, are not at all analogous to athletic coaches. It is no part of the duty of an athletic coach to study the actual operation of a sport, nor is it the duty of an athletic coach internally to increase the integrity of her sport. It is instead the duty of a coach to teach their athletes how to win competitions. So Veblen was seriously incorrect to analogize law professors to coaches. But ambiguity about the disciplinarity of our scholarship does arise when our work is evaluated from the perspective of method. When we seek internally to understand the law, we employ hermeneutic methods that we share with all literate members of the legal profession. Judges, no less than legal scholars, can perceive and seek to improve the integrity of the law. We law professors may have the advantage of time for study and for reflection and for specialization, but we have no monopoly of method. This shared commitment to legal hermeneutics has been responsible for depriving legal academia of some of the more traditional indicia of a scholarly discipline. So, for example, we do not possess programs specifically devoted to the professional training of apprentice scholars. We do not reproduce the legal professoriate through PhD programs, as do most other disciplines. We have historically believed that candidates for legal scholarship need only be excellent lawyers, fluent in the language of the law. When legal scholars engage in the external study of the law, moreover, we generally employ the methods of allied disciplines. We typically employ the techniques of economics or philosophy or political science or history or sociology to understand how legal institutions are actually working. But when we do that, we also confess our lack of any monopoly of methods because we're borrowing these methods from allied disciplines. And so since whichever way we go, we borrow method, can we nevertheless claim the disciplinary authority necessary to justify academic freedom of research? That's the question. And I believe that we can. The justification for our claim 
derives, in my view, from two aspects of our work. The first is the scope of our expertise. We are the only institution within the university comprehensively to study legal institutions in all of their many manifestations. Insofar as legal institutions share common features by virtue of their shared commitment to the rule of law, we study a unique object of expertise whose features are not studied anywhere else in society. And the second aspect of our work that supports our claim to academic freedom of research is the fusion of internal and external perspectives that is uniquely characteristic of modern legal scholarship. Lawyers and judges may claim an expertise in the internal dimensions of the law, but neither lawyers nor judges can systematically claim the kind of external knowledge of legal institutions that is routinely wielded by legal scholars. Law schools are the only place on earth where the internal study of law is systematically interrogated by external accounts of how legal institutions actually operate. And so, contra Veblen, it seems to me that the AALS was correct to stake out for legal scholars the prerogatives of academic freedom of research. Our scholarship qualifies as producing unique disciplinary knowledge. And to get some sense of how distinctive our, claim, our, our claims of common work are, recall what it means to be in the presence of some young scholar who's applying for a job, and you're thinking, well, that's all very nice writing, but really it should be in an economics department or a history department. That is an intelligible thing, judgment for us to make, because we inhabit a shared community of inquiry that uniquely fuses internal and external perspectives. So for example, legal scholarship is characteristically normative precisely because of the pressures that arise from an internal point of view. The normativity that we have in our scholarship would render much of our scholarship completely out of place in the Department of Political Science or History. Legal scholarship differs from the work of lawyers and judges, on the other hand, because in law schools, the merely internal understandings of the law are not received with piety. We instead scrutinize those claims in light of what the external study of the law tells us about the actual operation of legal institutions and systems. And Pachi Judge Harry Edwards, who's quite vocal on this point, our work is relevant to judges because they need a better external understanding of the nature of the law. Never forget that you in this room are educating the next generation of judges. And if you succeed, future ju judicial decision-making will be better informed than that which preceded it. You will teach future judges how the actual operation of legal institutions ought to affect internal understandings of the law. And if considerations of role morality predispose sitting judges to ignore these lessons, we can afford to be patient because our work will ripen in time. We should be proud of our mission and of our unique expertise. We should stand tall in these days of crisis for legal education when we hear so many advocate that law schools should only offer what amounts to coaching for future athletes. Of course, of course we should make every effort to ensure the future careers and livelihood of our graduates. But at this time of legal education in the crossroads, we should also remember that we have something important to contribute to the world, something that cannot be duplicated anywhere else. We are engines of improvement and knowledge. This is the vision for which the AALS has always stood, and we ought not to lose sight of it now. This is the vision that justifies our claim to academic freedom of research, and that testifies to our proper position within the modern research university.